This is the most brutal, giant's cone death penalty, on the entire planet. The prisoner is bound to an iron ring, and wears a prison uniform with a target on it. At the command of the planet's leader, a huge iron cone will pierce through the target. The order has been given, and a blue light flashes inside the prisoner's mask. The previous prisoner has now transformed into the planet's leader, while the real criminal steals the sapphire cane and escapes the execution site. It's hard to imagine that this careless and casual vendor is the future leader who will weaken the Galactic Empire. You see, the Galactic Empire has a history of 12,000 years, until DR Selden made an astonishing prediction that the Empire is on the verge of collapse, the entire galaxy will turn into ruins, and the Dark Ages will last for 30,000 years. Selden wants to shorten the Dark Ages, and has devised a detailed plan for it, but he unexpectedly faces rebellion from a genius girl. The plan is altered, and Selden becomes a consciousness entity, while the genius girl Gal returns to her hometown of Synax, and unexpectedly meets her own daughter, Salva. Due to a long period of cryogenic hibernation, Gal appears younger than her daughter, now the Empire is declining as Selden predicted. However, the first foundation in the peripheral star systems continues to grow, and has already infiltrated the Empire's planets, but Emperor David lacks a sense of crisis, and not only indulges in pleasure, but also gets attacked by assassins. The AI woman, Mel, gets half of her head cut off, but David takes the opportunity to grab a brazier and counterattack. He easily defeats the assassin, but unexpectedly, the assassin has an accomplice. They even break through David's protective shield, and shoot him in the shoulder. Fortunately, the Emperor reacts quickly, and picks up a gun from the ground to kill the opponent. He engages in close combat with the assassin. It's a real physical fight. After all, David didn't even have time to put on his clothes. David slips on a bloodstain, and gets a chest wound due to a momentary lapse of attention. Mel acts in time to kill the assassin. Since the molecular blade was coated with a deadly poison, Mel injects an antidote into David's heart, saving his life. However, when treating injuries, David insists on not using anesthesia because he is afraid of falling asleep. He suspects that this assassin is likely connected to his brothers, Dewar and Bernie, as the three of them hold power over the entire empire. Once someone dies, a corresponding clone will be activated. If he falls asleep, what will happen if he is replaced by a clone? David is currently in an unstable state in the empire. His policy of alliances and marriages goes against the beliefs of others. At this moment, the assassin's identities are revealed, and they are all blind angels. They have undergone psychological encryption, and no information can be obtained from their bodies. David cannot forgive this event. He kills the head of the security team, and orders the interrogation of the on-duty guards. After dismissing the irrelevant people, David tells Dewar that he is afraid of death, afraid of being replaced by a clone. Dewar retorts, asking why David would get married, and have children to propagate descendants if he is afraid of death. If being replaced by descendants is what truly brings about his demise, then only the perpetual iteration of clones can ensure his eternal dominance. Only when the three brothers, Dewa, David, and Bernie, can forever reign supreme over the empire. David does not refute this theory, but instead instructs Dewa and Bernie to undergo independent neural overlays. David wants to examine their memories to ensure that they were not involved in today's assassination attempt. David knows that reforms are difficult, and he has chosen Queen Sarath as his marriage partner. Bernie criticizes that this woman only ascended to the throne through clever planning, and suggests that she might kill David to seize power. David ignored the other's sarcasm and mockery. He is determined to push for reforms for a reason. Centuries ago, David I had his genes tampered with by a rebel army, resulting in subsequent clones gradually diverging from the original genetic source. The three of them have long been different from the original, so it's time to make some changes. The queen brought a gift of pure, and pristine pigments, and David reciprocated with a Trantor model made of brass. The queen accepted the miniature version of the imperial capital, without expressing gratitude. It was evident that she had noticed the decline of the empire, and didn't miss any opportunity to taunt David. Just as the atmosphere grew increasingly tense, Mel interrupted their conversation, and delivered a message to the emperor. They found the body of Commander, who was dispatched by David 12 to the outer star regions. His body had been floating in space for over a century, seemingly destroyed by a solar flare, resulting in the extinction of all life in the entire galaxy. Due to the Empire's focus on addressing the corruption within the dynasty at that time, a thorough investigation was not conducted. It wasn't until Mel watched the Commander's pre-death footage, and learned that the solar flare was just an illusion, that the Anacreans never perished, but instead quietly stationed themselves in the outer star regions, and grew stronger, that David realized the seriousness of the situation. Meanwhile, something significant happened within the first foundation in the outer star regions. After a century, the vault opened once again, indicating the possible return of Selden, and he will lead them to fight against the Empire. On the other side, Synax was almost submerged by seawater. In the vast expanse of the sky, 
Only Gal and Salva, this mother and daughter remained, apart from their blood ties, they hardly had any connection. However, blood ties were already magical enough. For instance, Gal had the ability to foresee the future, while her daughter could glimpse the past. Salva asked Gal why she didn't activate the Elementor, and she replied that they hadn't found the right tool yet. Upon hearing this, Salva tossed a coin. Gal knew she couldn't hide the truth, and confessed that she trapped Selden inside, which is why she couldn't activate the Elementor freely. At this point, there is another question. Selden's consciousness was supposed to be trapped within the vault, but according to Gal, she imprisoned the Doctor inside the Elementor, resulting in at least two instances of Doctor's consciousness. Gal doesn't trust Selden's salvation plan, so she hesitates to open it. However, this time, under Salva's persuasion, she still opened the Elementor, which generated two lines, red and blue. The red nodes represent the first crisis she encountered, and as she progresses 138 years forward, the second node appears, followed by the third and fourth. Humanity is about to enter an unprecedented dark era. We were supposed to follow the blue line, but we have gradually deviated onto the red line. If we cannot resolve the crisis of the second node, everything prophesied by Selden will come true. At this moment, the Doctor is inside the Elementor, which is a four-dimensional space. Even with Selden's intelligence, it is challenging to find a solution. Suddenly, he recalls a childhood paper-folding game, where three-dimensional objects cast two-dimensional shadows on stones. Inspired by this, Selden continues to explore within the four-dimensional space, and unexpectedly sees his deceased wife. They exchange a few words, and he realizes that she is not his wife, but rather the autonomous consciousness of the Elementor, capable of transforming into any form. It enjoys observing human behavior, and even wants to help Selden escape, so it gave him a hint. Don't overcomplicate things. If you were a child, how would you choose? This simple statement awakened Selden from his reverie. By flattening and unfolding the four-dimensional space, he could escape this predicament. At this moment, Gal and Salva intended to activate the old spaceship underwater, and they both jumped into the sea. Salva found the launch device of the spaceship, but before she could successfully open it, she started to faint due to lack of oxygen. Gal quickly realized the situation, and rushed to provide her with oxygen. With their combined efforts, the beggar finally surfaced successfully. Unfortunately, it had suffered corrosion underwater for hundreds of years, and couldn't ascend and fly smoothly. Salva wanted Gal to release Selden to repair the ship, but before they could take action, Selden's consciousness emerged on its own. Although he deeply resents Gal's betrayal, but the sea is rough, now we need to repair the spaceship first, or else all three of them will be in trouble. Selden easily identified the malfunction, but one stabilizer was jammed. It requires manual repair. Salva disregarded the danger and rushed out of the cabin to fix it. Fortunately, she successfully resolved the issue, but the sea was too turbulent. She couldn't return to the cabin in a short time. Salva instructed Gal to start the spaceship first, and she successfully returned to the cabin when the flight stabilized. Salva asked Selden why he wanted to establish the second foundation. The reason is quite simple. Although the decline of the empire is inevitable, the generation of corruption from power is an eternal law. If we don't restrain the development of Terminus, the first foundation, it will soon become the second empire. So, regardless of the battle between Terminus and Trantor, whether it's a loss or a win, we must strangle it in the cradle. The second foundation is the tool to correct its development. His predictions about the future are based on mathematical algorithms. They are absolutely rational. But Gal, in her precognitive dreams, can see personal suffering and death. She also glimpses an alternative outcome. In her dreams, Gal can sense that she is the one who has disrupted the equation's progress. Perhaps the same intuition can restore the equation, and Salva can enhance her precognitive abilities. So the two of them work together to open that segment of the outcome. A mysterious person is calling out to Gal through the cryptic words of the other. It can be inferred that the second foundation has already been established. A person named Malo weakened the empire. And in the future, Gal has a telepathic companion. Immediately after, Salva wakes Gal up. Selden immediately asks about the situation. Gal says, I saw a powerful psychic, who has already defeated most of the galaxy's territories, and even knows that I am peering into the future. The mysterious person wants to extract the location of the second foundation, from Gal's mind, because he believes that only the foundation, can thwart his plans, while the mysterious person reads Gal's mind. She can also see the thoughts of the other person. Inside, there is a crucial location, Ignis. The three of them decide to investigate this planet. However, Gal conceals one thing. She also saw Salva's corpse in her prophecy, on the other side of the Galactic Empire. David, through memory examination, has ruled out the suspicion of his two brothers' assassination. Mel has found a fleet to deal with the Foundation, but the Emperor is dissatisfied with General Rios, the fleet's leader. 
because he had previously defied his orders, and has been in exile for six years. However, David is well aware, that this person is indeed the best choice. One unfortunate event follows another. This strengthens David's determination to form an alliance. So, he and his two brothers, invite the queen to dinner. But this woman brings up one sensitive topic after another. She immediately asks if the inheritance pattern will change. After the birth of a child, David and Bernie would suffer a great loss. If a suddenly born child, could obtain the throne they can never attain. The three of them immediately say, we are united. David becoming the emperor means we are the emperor. To alleviate the awkwardness of the dinner, David takes the queen to see the body of the former emperor, and other dormant clones. David also tells the queen that he is infertile, but the laboratory can fix it. However, to ensure the quality of their descendants, he suggests combining their genetic makeup first, and then selecting the best embryo to implant in the mother. From this, we can see that David has awakened. He no longer wants to stay in line with Dewar and Bernie. He is ready to use this gathering, to completely overthrow the rules left by the empire. The scene shifts to the outer region of the star system. Savina, a red-robed female religious leader rides on a mount. She intends to spread the prophecy of Selden's return to the Foundation, to gather more supporters for the Foundation. Unexpectedly, she faces threats from the indigenous people. Someone kills her companion, and displays their body tied to a tree trunk. The female religious leader persists in preaching to the crowd. Yet, the indigenous people don't believe her words, and plan to drive her out of Savina. In a critical moment, a beam of white light appears in the sky. A bishop dressed in red robes descends from above. With a single gesture, he throws the protesters into a pool. Then the bishop releases flames from both hands, and displays a holographic image of Selden. Seeing that the indigenous people are swayed by the miracle, the religious leader receives a message on her wristband. Both of them quickly return to the spaceship to check. The vault is already open, and they must rush back to Terminus, because Selden is re-emerging, which means the second node is about to arrive. The two of them quickly return to the foundation. The supreme commander comes out to greet the religious leader. It turns out she is the commander's daughter, but the supreme commander doesn't like the church. There is a hidden undercurrent within Terminus. Everyone desires power. This is confirming Selden's prophecy. Given time, this place will become the second empire. The group arrives together beneath the vault. The watcher takes the lead, considering himself the most qualified to converse with Selden. Unexpectedly, a white light flashes within the vault and lifts the Watcher into the air. The next moment, he keeps muttering, Mallow, which is the name Gaal heard in the future. Immediately after, the Watcher explodes into powder. On the other side, Gaal and the others have arrived at their destination. However, Selden says this place is not Ignis, but an abandoned mining base of the Empire. He secretly changed the route without informing the two, because Selden senses that his original self is here. Gaal agrees to give him only six hours, whether they find his original self or not. They will leave this place when the time is up. Salva leaves behind to guard the beggar. Gaal and Selden set out together. They enter a massive cave. Selden is familiar with the pathways here. He confidently leads Gaal forward. They open a hidden door on one side. Inside, there is a woman dressed in a deep blue gown. This person is Kali, Selden's former teacher. Normally, she should have died hundreds of years ago. She holds a mysterious orb in her hands. Gaal has many questions. The two of them play riddles in front of her. Selden even asks Gaal to leave first. And with that, he disappears behind the door with Kali. Gaal can only return to the spaceship. She and Salva plan to leave this place. Unexpectedly, the ground sinks suddenly. The spaceship is momentarily exposed to the underground. Several spider-like giant machines appear. Salva immediately pilots the spaceship out of the ground, while the two mechanical monsters burrow back into the sand. It seems they were attracted by something. Gaal found it strange and decided to scan the ground. As a result, she discovered signs of life. The two of them hurriedly approach the location of the red dot. As a result, Gaal found Selden's original body. This time, it wasn't a virtual projection of consciousness, but an actual human being. At that moment, Gaal saw Kali standing in the eyes of the statue, with a mysterious smile gradually fading away. Meanwhile, the mechanical monsters had caught up. The massive statue was about to collapse. Gaal immediately took Selden back to the spaceship. At this moment, the doctor had already regained consciousness. On the other side, the Great Emperor was preparing to send armed forces to suppress Terminus, ready to follow Mel's advice, release General Rios, who was imprisoned, giving him an opportunity to earn merits despite his guilt. Rios didn't want to go back and serve the Great Emperor, but his family's lives were in the Emperor's hands. Rios could only grit his teeth and return to the Empire. He wept bitterly in front of his family, washing away the dust from his body, cutting off his hair like a weed, returning to his original fleet. Rios didn't want to assist the Great Emperor at all, but in critical moments, David would sacrifice the lives of everyone. That's why Rios chose to stay. He had to shoulder the mission of protecting the Empire. On the other side, the Bishop and the Nun, 
were planning to find Mallow. Fortunately, the bishop knew this person. He was nothing more than a cunning thug. He couldn't understand why the vault would give such instructions, based on the clues provided by the bishop's informant. That person Mallow was currently on the planet Krell. He was trying to sell a bracelet called Castling. Castling is a move in chess. It allows a player to simultaneously move their king and one rook. As the name suggests, two people wearing the bracelets can exchange positions. The general was very interested upon hearing this and decided to give it a try. For safety reasons, he had Mallow wear another bracelet. If there were any issues with the device, no one could escape. So, they pressed the button, and unexpectedly, they successfully swapped positions. Just as the general was about to make an impulsive move, he realized that during the exchange, Mallow had stolen the sapphire from the cane. However, before the latter could escape, he was apprehended by the general's subordinates, and they took the bracelet from him. When the bishop and the nun hurriedly arrived on Krell, Mallow was about to face execution. He was bound to an iron bed, with a diamond-shaped target on his jumpsuit's chest. With a single execution order, a pointed cone would pierce through the target from above. At the critical moment, a flash of blue light appeared inside his helmet. He and the general swapped positions once again. The executioner quickly grabbed the iron cone. Meanwhile, Mallow took out the substitution chip from his mouth, indicating that the bracelet was secondary, and this thing was the core. He calmly walked away with the sapphire, even planning to hijack the bishop's spaceship. Fortunately, the nun and the bishop reacted quickly, running back to the spaceship in time. The nun administered a special drug injection to Mallow, bringing him back to Terminus. The bishop and the commander took him below the vault, and it was indeed spectacular. Even Mallow's name appeared on it. The bishop asked him to go inside, and have a conversation with Selden, as the prophet specifically named Mallow. The commander couldn't help but speak up, unsure if it was an invitation. After speaking, he looked at the charred ground, which was the ashes of the Watcher. Upon hearing this, Mallow hesitated and didn't want to take the risk. However, he had no choice in the matter. As a beam of light sucked him in, the nun and others quickly followed suit. They entered a mysterious space, and suddenly Mallow rushed in and snatched the nun's water bottle. He claimed that he had been there for two days, but in reality, it was only a matter of two minutes. Just as the four of them didn't know what to do, a melodious music rang out, and they saw a library. The table was filled with food, and Mallow immediately rushed over, and started eating voraciously. Shortly after, Selden appeared in this place. The entire vault was his algorithm, and everything here was composed of molecules, all originating from Selden. Even the food Mallow put into his mouth was a part of him. The three individuals from Terminus highly respected Selden, and he also had tasks to assign to them. At this moment, the bishop noticed the Elementor on the table, and couldn't help but ask why it was there. Wasn't it Selden who took the Elementor away a century ago? Selden explained that the Elementor is a quantum computer that exists in a superposition state, allowing it to be present in two places simultaneously. Selden needed the bishop and the others to go to Trantor and establish diplomatic relations, delaying the outbreak of war as much as possible. They were not allowed to pilot jump ships, because the Empire did not permit such advanced technology in the periphery, revealing it would trigger an immediate war. After Selden assigned the tasks, he asked them to leave, while the bishop hesitated, and wanted to know why Selden wanted to blow up the Watchers. Selden explained, that it was necessary to occasionally display anger to suppress the people, and punishing the arrogant Watchers was a way of setting an example. The bishop left deep in thought, leave Selden and Mallow alone for a conversation. The professor had another task for Mallow, but he didn't reveal it explicitly, leaving it as a mystery. The bishop and the others parted ways with Mallow, and the nun even lent him her mount. Meanwhile, Ryos planned to visit Savannah, and gather information before heading to Terminus. Since Savannah was a zero-class civilization, primarily an agrarian society, they had to be discreet, to avoid causing panic among the indigenous population. Ryos landed with his close friend member, Mustached Man. On the way, the two encountered a group of locals, and picked up the evacuation device dropped by the fleet. Ryos and Mustached Man put down their weapons, expressing that they had no hostile intentions, and were willing to pay a hefty price to buy back the device. However, the indigenous people showed no respect, and spat in Mustached Man's face as soon as they approached. Seeing this, Ryos threw a punch, and Mustached Man quickly subdued the indigenous person, threatening the others to return the device. They promised to release the captives once they had the item, but they underestimated the savagery of the locals. These people didn't care about the well-being of their comrades, and a major conflict was about to erupt. Ryos had spent many years in prison, but his skills had not deteriorated at all. Even Mustached Man recognized this, and realized that Ryos enjoyed violence. After Ryos killed the group, a satisfied smile appeared on his face. Mustached Man had some reservations about this, and advised Ryos to keep a calm mind, and not let violence dominate him. The two of them left with the evacuation device, 
and quickly found the informant's residence. Unexpectedly, an old man aimed a gun at them. Rios recognized him as the informant, Doosome, and then confessed their identities and purpose. Upon hearing this, the man brought them inside the house. Doosome has been guarding this wilderness for 40 years, always hoping to return to the Empire. Therefore, he shared all the information he knew with Rios. Indeed, not long ago, there were red-robed missionaries who arrived to preach in this area, and they had wristbands made by the Empire. The two missionaries claimed that a prophet named Selden lived inside the vault, and could help people escape from the disaster. The most important thing is that the missionaries left on a teleportation spaceship, a technology only the Empire can use. If Terminus has the ability to produce teleportation spaceships, it would prove that they have developed to a considerable scale. Just then, the indigenous people chased them to the door, Doosome opened a secret passage behind the bookshelf for them to escape, and asked Selden to give him a shot, because those indigenous people would not spare Doosome. He would rather die by an Empire bullet. Rios understood what he meant and could only shoot him. Afterward, the two opened the evacuation device, pressed the activation button, and were instantly sucked into the light cylinder, leaving the ground. The camera switches to the Empire side, where the Queen is taking a stroll with Dua. The atmosphere is exceptionally harmonious with beautiful people. Dua wants to know if the assassination of the Emperor has anything to do with the Queen, but the other party immediately vetoed it, and counter-questioned Dua if David was responsible for the death of her family. The Queen's speculation is not without reason. She was not the heir to the throne before, but a sudden plane crash killed all the rightful heirs before her, and those sisters would never agree to a marriage alliance. The weakest Queen was pushed onto the throne, and had to accept the Emperor's marriage proposal. It doesn't seem like a coincidence at all. Dua still defends David and believes that he didn't do it. Nevertheless, he does admire the Queen, and even has some feelings for her. The Queen also asked him, Since you three brothers are one entity, why can't you marry me? I think we are more suitable for each other. The Queen disrupted the situation and left gracefully. She summoned the guards of the Empire, and stated that she had a method to deceive memory searches, so today's conversation must be kept confidential. The Queen requested the other party to investigate if David had targeted her family, and obtain the recording of the day the Emperor was assassinated. These two people placed their palms on the ice coffin, and the body inside was instantly activated. The revival of the body unveiled a millennium-long secret, and changed the entire galaxy, and the old man was the first emperor at the beginning of the empire's establishment. All subsequent successors were his clones, ensuring his rule for eternity. As the galactic empire developed, it was governed by three individuals who carried the old man's genes. They are Dua, David, and Bernie. Currently, David has overridden the rights of the other two, even altering Dua's and Bernie's memories without their consent, causing an imbalance in the power triangle of the empire. That's why Dua and Bernie activated the first emperor, hoping he would come out and restore justice. However, before they could finish speaking, they were interrupted. The first emperor believed that the three were one entity, and shouldn't be divided by power. Jealousy toward David is equivalent to jealousy toward oneself. After saying this, he returned to the ice coffin. The two of them were disappointed, and had to access the database to retrieve all the memory files. Unexpectedly, they encountered a problem. Almost all emperors had around 80 memory files, but the first emperor had 213. Although the first generation had more life experiences, the difference was unusually large. Bernie suspects that they are missing some memories, and can only investigate slowly to uncover the truth. Meanwhile, Queen Sarath is still investigating the cause of her parents' deaths. She had sent assassins to kill the suspect David, but he emerged unscathed. To determine where the problem lies, the Queen wanted to obtain the footage of the assassination attempt on David, but she discovered that all records from that day had been deleted. In this situation, the only option was to enter David's chambers and investigate. After all, as the betrothed, it was natural for her to spend the night with David. That night, the Queen successfully entered the chambers, and used the excuse of visiting to inspect the walls. As expected, she found traces of a struggle. The Queen climbed onto the bed, intending to continue her questioning. It was only then that David realized, that this woman had no intention of being intimate with him. Her request to spend the night was merely, a ploy to find out why the assassination attempt had failed. David flew into a rage and drove her away. Fortunately, there was the caring AI companion, Mel, to soothe the anger in David's heart. The next day, the Queen approached her informant, the guard. Since she couldn't obtain the footage of the assassination attempt, she instructed him to investigate the memories of the therapist. If David had been injured by an assassin, there would certainly be images of him receiving treatment. But the guard went to the data repository, and falsely claimed that the Emperor wanted to review the memories of the healing chamber. The person in charge of the data didn't question it, and immediately handed over the memory files to the, the guard, 
who then passed them on to the queen, they viewed the footage and discovered that Mel, who was with David, was not human but an AI robot, it had been forbidden to create mechanical beings on Trantor thousands of years ago, so it must have been Mel who saved David, let's temporarily set aside the situation with the Empire, and take a look at the female lead girl side, she and her daughter, Salva, discovered the true body of Harry Selden, nobody knows why Harry Selden, who died over a hundred years ago, suddenly had a physical form, the three of them traveled to Ignis on the Beggar, a place that used to be an imperial outpost a thousand years ago, the ecosystem there is diverse, but humans have not resided there since the Empire withdrew, however, Gal and her daughter heard a calling that led them to enter Ignis, unexpectedly, as soon as the ship entered the atmosphere, it encountered a large number of negative ions, causing a system failure and reboot, the Beggar's engines shut down, causing it to crash into the ground, Salva quickly extinguished the sparks in the cabin, and asked Gal and Selden to stay behind and repair the ship, Salva would go on patrol in the vicinity, to see if there were any traces of humans, shortly after Salva entered the forest, she spotted a suspicious figure dressed in black, she hid behind a large rock and prepared to ambush, unexpectedly, the person in black removed his mask, revealing a familiar face, it was Salva's boyfriend, Hugo, but the problem was, that Salva had been in cryosleep for a hundred years, so logically Hugo should have died long ago, therefore, she didn't let her guard down, seeing the situation, Hugo had no choice, but to patiently explain that after Salva entered the cryosleep chamber, he no longer had any attachment to the world, so he chose to go into hibernation with her, Hugo pushed aside Salva's gun, and twirled her spinning around in place, both of them laughing and joking, before returning to the beggar, Selden became very cautious upon seeing the stranger, and instructed Gal to quickly hide the Elementer, and then verify the stranger's identity at the cabin door, Salva explained that Hugo was her boyfriend, and the original owner of the beggar, but the ship's recognition system detected that Hugo's weight was 3 kilograms less, and there were slight differences in height, Selden refused to let them pass, reasoning that since the beggar was once Hugo's ship, his genetic information must be stored in the system's code, Selden instructed Salva to give control back to Hugo, and see if the beggar recognized him as the owner, helpless, Salva complied, just then, Gal noticed a life form approaching the ship, and shouted at Salva to be careful, the next moment, Hugo, reverted to his true form, and grabbed Salva by the neck, immediately, the beggar was blasted open, and a group of mysterious individuals rushed into the ship, despite the three of them putting up a fight, the leader of the group simply said, shut down their brains, the main characters fell to the ground, when they woke up, they found themselves in an abandoned summer palace, there were no guards around, but strange sounds could be heard in the distance, the three of them followed the sounds and entered a cave, where they found a group of people surrounding a girl in white, she claimed to be the priestess of the eternal temple, and Selden took a step forward to pay his respects, however, the girl already knew the backgrounds of the three individuals, and had someone bring them fresh food, it seemed that she meant no harm, but Selden noticed that the girl had no shadow, and he immediately exposed her as a mere projection, demanding the true authority figure to reveal themselves. As expected, the girl disappeared, and the female leader then greeted everyone in person. She was a mind reader with the ability to hear thoughts, and everyone who came to this place was of the same kind, only they could hear the summons of the female leader. The voices that Gal and Salva heard before were emitted by her. The female leader instructed the group to rest, and meet for a detailed discussion the next day. However, as soon as the main characters left, she set her sights on the Elementer, the female leader wanted to destroy the sacred artifact, and prevent the construction of the second foundation, the next day, Salva woke up early and, to some extent, had the ability to read minds, allowing her to sense the thoughts of the local people, Salva discovered, that these people had been subjected to inhumane persecution due to their mind-reading abilities, it was the female leader who saved them, and brought them to Ignis for safety, later, the three of them met with the female leader, and Selden wasted no time in stating that Gal had precognitive abilities. Gal had seen a mysterious mind reader named Mule who would destroy everything in Ignis. The female leader didn't believe that anyone could predict the future, so she decided to test Gal. To her surprise, Gal indeed saw their homeland being destroyed. However, the female leader believed that the future Gal saw was filtered through Selden's constructed perception and was therefore subjective. She didn't think that the so called future was certain to happen. The female leader was unwilling to help Selden build the second foundation, she only wanted to protect her own children. Shortly after, the female leader had a private conversation with Gal, and revealed that her health was deteriorating. She wanted to entrust the people of Ignis to Gal. This way, Gal would have the ability to protect Salva, but the condition was that Selden couldn't be involved. Gal was indeed convinced by the female leader, and immediately went to discuss it with Selden. She wanted to stay and establish the second foundation here, leading all the mind readers, but Selden couldn't interfere. Upon hearing this, 
Selden became very angry. Selden urged Gaal to be more aware, as the female leader had the ability to manipulate anyone's thoughts. He advised Gaal not to allow her to control him. The two of them argued and parted ways unhappily. Selden instructed Salva to keep an eye on Gaal, because only she knew the location of the Elementor. They must not let it fall into the hands of the female leader. Just as Salva found Gaal, they suddenly heard the sound of a spaceship starting. They rushed out to see Selden piloting the beggar to leave. However, it was all a deception. In reality, the female leader had captured Selden, and fabricated the illusion of him flying away. This way, the female leader could better control Gaal. She ordered her subordinates to drown Selden, and as the water submerged his head, he looked back on his life. During Selden's time as a university professor, he had the idea of creating the Elementor. At that time, there was only one woman named Yona who always accompanied Selden. They shared everything and had compatible thoughts. With Yona's companionship, Selden successfully created the prototype of the Elementor, and they even had an unborn daughter. Unexpectedly, the Empire quickly became interested in the Elementor. They demanded that Selden continue his research on Trantor, which meant that the Elementor would fall into the hands of the Empire. Selden refused to agree, no matter what they said. Little did he know, the Empire's people captured Yona, and claimed that Selden could see his beloved again if he handed over the Elementor. Pretending to agree, Selden led the Empire's messenger into the wilderness until there was no one around. Then, Selden pulled out the necklace from his chest. There were originally two glowing dots on it, representing the heartbeats of Yona and their child. But this morning, the dots disappeared, which meant that the Empire was lying. They had already killed Yona, and now wanted to deceive Selden to hand over the Elementor. Now, he was going to make the Empire's messenger pay the price. Selden activated the sheepdog machine, and summoned a large group of terrifying moonlight sharp birds. Since his childhood, he had been testing these creatures with adults, and had long figured out the movement patterns of sharp birds. Selden could stand among the flock of birds, safely avoiding all danger. He pushed the messenger into the birds, causing the person to be crushed into a pulp. Selden never expected to recall this painful memory on his deathbed. Yona's voice, appearance, and laughter kept appearing in his mind. He sank in the water, losing the strength to struggle. Meanwhile, inside the Galactic Empire, a spaceship from Terminus approached Trantor, the nun and the bishop, guided by the consciousness of Prophet Selden, prepared to establish diplomatic relations with the Galactic Empire, delaying the outbreak of war. As they gazed upon the magnificent Trantor, they could hardly believe the Prophet's prediction that it would face destruction. The staff at the Trantor station logged in the information of each visitor. When they heard that the two individuals were messengers from Terminus, they couldn't help but make sarcastic remarks, considering anyone from the outer regions as Hicks in the eyes of the imperial capital, Trantor. In the evening, the bishop and the nun took rest at a cheap hotel, but before long, imperial soldiers stormed in and captured them. At the same time, David arrived at a massive arena where the entire empire's population gathered. He gave the order to unveil the golden cloth ahead, revealing the statue of Vinosept, the only empress in the galactic empire's history, but not the last. David invited the queen to the stage, officially announcing their engagement. Their union meant the end of the clone's inheritance of the throne. Bernie and Dewar had mixed feelings, while the Queen and David harbored their own secrets. Mallow, sent by Prophet Selden on the other side, is currently completing other tasks. He boarded the Ghost, and arrived at the coordinates set by Selden, only to find nothing here. When Mallow didn't know what to do, a gigantic spaceship zoomed past overhead. The Ghost, for unknown reasons, somehow docked with the large spaceship. Mallow had no choice but to step out of the airlock and investigate, only to walk into a massive hive filled with countless spacemen. They are a servile race developed by the Empire. Hai la dimora base? And spacemen have the ability to randomly jump through space, with only their kind knowing their locations. Therefore, the unexpected appearance of Mallow aroused suspicion among the spacemen. Seeing the situation, Mallow hastily threw a piece of protein stone, a mineral that is essential for the survival of spacemen, and cannot be synthesized. The Empire controls the spacemen to navigate their ships by relying on protein stone resources. However, Scientists under Prophet Selden have already discovered a method to synthesize protein stone, and Terminus has developed new spacecraft, that can make jumps without the need for spacemen's guidance. If the Empire could obtain this technology, they would completely abandon the spacemen, and sever the supply of protein stone. So, Mallow hopes to collaborate with the spacemen, as hitting the Empire's vital points would grant the spacemen freedom, and a continuous supply of protein stone. This deal sounds very profitable, but the spacemen are unwilling to take the risk, because 10% of their descendants are under the Empire's control. The spacemen immediately reported to General Moss, that they intercepted a spacecraft from Terminus. Soon, Mallow was escorted to Moss by the Hive. This kind of high technology shouldn't appear on Terminus. It seems that this inconspicuous outer region has, become a security threat. Mallow pretended to surrender, and prepared to open the Ghost, 
but released the beast sent by the nun to attack Moss. He took the opportunity to slip into the ghost and escape the hive, successfully making a jump in the small hangar. This action completely exposed the capabilities of Terminus. On the other side, the bishop and the nun were imprisoned in a cell while David was monitoring them from outside. He had recently sent Moss to survey the outer regions, and Terminus promptly sent two envoys, which was highly suspicious. David intended to leave them hanging for the time being. Meanwhile, Mel was escorting the queen to see a doctor for a premarital health checkup. On the way, the queen directly confronted Mel, saying, I know you're a robot. Mel, on the other hand, remained unfazed and stated that she was the last remaining robot, with the purpose of protecting the empire. Subsequently, the doctor proceeded to examine the queen's uterus, and intended to administer a sedative for ovum retrieval. However, the queen firmly stated that she would not allow the empire to take anything from her until the marriage was confirmed. Mel had had enough of the queen's arrogance, and warned her that if she continued to be stubborn, she should think about the gruesome deaths of her parents and siblings. The queen completely broke down upon hearing this, and became even more convinced that the empire had killed her family. At this moment, David received a message from Moss, informing him that the spaceship technology of Terminus far surpassed that of the Empire, and didn't require spacemen for navigation, and they also wanted to tempt spacemen into betraying the Empire. David became agitated upon hearing this, and ordered Moss to stand by temporarily, just as he was deep in thought. The Queen was secretly meeting with Dewar, and both of them were using facial disruptors, to avoid being detected by anyone. The Queen expressed her belief that David killed her entire family, and she cannot bear his children. Therefore, the queen wants to have Dewar's child since the three brothers have the same genes, and David will never know the truth. Dewar was evidently persuaded by the queen. That night, David summoned him and Bernie, and the three of them met with the bishop and the nun. The bishops demanded that the empire recognize the status and autonomy of Terminus in the galaxy. Bernie interrupted and stated that Terminus belongs to the empire and is not a partner, so they have no right to make any demands. The bishop wanted to say a few more words, but David revealed that their subordinate, Mallow, had attempted to incite spacemen to betray the Empire earlier that day. He questioned their true intentions in engaging in deceptive negotiations. The bishop was shocked to hear this. He had no knowledge of Mallow's actions, nor did he understand the motives of the Prophet. However, the nun remained calm. Observing her composed demeanor, David allowed the nun to step forward. Unexpectedly, she suddenly transformed into the Prophet Selden. This technique is called dual brain scanning, whereby Selden temporarily transferred a part of himself into the nun. Selden warned David not to underestimate Terminus, as they possess advanced technology, spaceships, and a powerful army. They came seeking peace not out of fear, but because, in a war, Terminus would undoubtedly emerge victorious. Selden's words completely infuriated David. He immediately ordered Moss to surround Terminus. If there were any valuable technologies there, they were to be thoroughly documented, and brought back to the Empire. After speaking, David ordered his subordinates to separate Selden. The nun collapsed to the ground and David stepped forward to help the girl up. He didn't forget to provoke the bishop, saying, Look at the prophet you follow. He's just a bastard who manipulates the believers. In fact, this aligns with Selden's original purpose. As mentioned in previous episodes, the generation of corruption from power is an eternal law. If Terminus is not restrained, it will quickly become the second empire. That's why Selden is preparing to build the second foundation, and provoking a war between Terminus, and Trantor is also part of his plan. The scene shifts back to Ignis. Salva really thought that Selden had left, so she also wanted to steal a spacecraft and escape, but Gaal was determined to stay. Their opinions diverged. During lunchtime, Gaal was constantly thinking about the mule. The telepaths around her heard her thoughts, so they asked Gaal who the mule really is. Gaal explained to everyone that the mule is a conqueror. The existence of telepaths is a threat to him. So, 152 years later, the mule will come to Ignis, and attempt to harm all telepaths. Selden, a long time ago, was able to predict the future through mathematical algorithms. His calculations were nearly perfect, resembling magic. Later, Selden discovered that telepaths could disrupt his calculations. Gaal, a telepath deeply fascinated by mathematics, admired him, and went to the galaxy to collaborate with Selden. The two of them immersed themselves in intense calculations. They arrived at the prophecy of the imminent collapse of the Empire. Gaal believed that the existence of telepaths was the key to turning the tide. They need foresight and planning, to resist the mule or the arrival of the end times. Just when Gaal was getting passionate, Salva quietly stayed by the coast. Earlier she noticed something strange with the fishing boat. When she went to check, she found that someone had deliberately cleared the fishing data. There must be something fishy about it. Late at night, she took the opportunity while everyone was asleep. Quietly, she boarded the fishing boat and set off to sea. She wanted to find out where it had been. However, she discovered Selden in the water. The next moment, the female leader appeared. 
and controlled Salva, causing her to sink into the water. Gal quickly realized that her daughter was missing. She ran to confront the female leader, who didn't bother pretending anymore. Not only did she refuse to let Gal see Salva, but she also revealed Selden's death. Gal wanted to resist but was powerless. This female leader had extraordinary abilities, and could almost control anyone's thoughts. She imprisoned Gal in a special jail, that could confine both the body and the mind. Salva was also locked in a similar place. To escape, they couldn't use their magical abilities, but had to rely on their minds and mathematics. Salva used the Elementor to find the Prophet Selden. Before Salva could explain her purpose, the Prophet Selden had a brainstorm. It was the first time he knew that the Elementor could open a quantum channel to enter the vault. The Prophet knew he was just a consciousness copy, but he couldn't figure out why Selden concealed such important information before his death. Could he not be the only copy? The Prophet Selden immediately deduced the purpose of the original. His existence was meant to inspire Terminus. Selden had also created other consciousness copies, presumably preparing to establish the second foundation, and conducting a control experiment. He and Terminus were just an experimental group. Salva was completely bewildered by the Prophet Selden's revelation. Man, please stop overthinking, and help me and Gal, she pleaded. Selden snapped out of his thoughts, and followed Salva back to the mental prison. Of course, their back and forth journeys were only within the realm of consciousness. Gal's physical body remained in the prison. The disruptor in that place was like a Lego toy to the Prophet Selden. He helped Salva resolve the prison's issue, and she informed the Prophet Selden of an important piece of information. In Gal's prophetic dream, there was a person named Mallow who would change everything. When the Prophet returned to the vault, he wrote down Mallow's name. A mysterious smile appeared on his face, while on the other side, Salva hurriedly left the prison to rescue someone. At this moment, Gal was bound to a stone slab, and the female leader was preparing to infiltrate her mind, because the former felt her own weakness, occupying a new incarnation every 60 years. Now the female leader had her eye on the powerful Gal, wanting to take her abilities for herself. Meanwhile, in the capital of the empire, Trantor, David put the bishop and the nun on the guillotine. This scene was simultaneously transmitted to Terminus. The supreme commander was extremely angry, because the nun was his own daughter. Only David, playing with collar of Typhon in his hand, this device could instantly sever a person's head. He put the collar on the nun's head, and the next second, the ghost ship instantly teleported to the scene. Mallow picked up the camera, signaling that the beheading show had come to an end. At this moment, the scene that he broke into in Trantor, had already spread throughout the interstellar space. This meant that Terminus had declared war on the Empire. Although the commander was speechless, there was nothing left but to go to war. Tranta's guillotine was already in chaos. Dewar didn't care about anything else, and quickly protected the queen. Little did he know that this scene was seen by the queen's confidant, and David's halo was damaged by the ship's pulse. He pushed aside Mel, who was protecting him, looking around in the ruins. At this time, Mallow found the nun, while the bishop fell into the hands of imperial soldiers. Suddenly, the nun's mount, Becky, rushed into the battlefield, directly running towards David. It forced the emperor to a corner. Fortunately, the surrounding soldiers noticed in time, and fired several shots, killing Becky. Mallow saw that the situation was out of control, and couldn't save the bishop in time, so he could only pull the nun and leave first. They used instant teleportation to leave Trantor. Now the entire interstellar space was focused on the Empire, and Bernie demanded an immediate war. However, David's attitude suddenly changed, insisting on personally going to Terminus for negotiations, and reclaiming the Empire's former territories. This statement was met with opposition from everyone except the Queen, who stood up to support David. I really don't know where this is going. David had made up his mind, handing Trantor over to Dewar's management, and preparing to go to Terminus with the bishop, not long after David left. His confidant, Archeon, went to find the queen, urging her to cut off contact with Dewar as soon as possible. If David discovers the dirty dealings between the two, the queen's home planet, Dominion, will face disaster. The emperor will definitely not tolerate such a scandal. Archeon reassured the queen, saying that as long as the wedding is completed, you can use any means to get rid of David. But for now, we must act with caution. Mallow, who was trying to escape, encountered trouble. Imperial General Moss intercepted his path. He also disabled the propulsion drive of the ghost. He demanded both ships to dock and meet face to face. The scene switches back to the other side on Trantor. As soon as David left, chaos ensued in the Empire. First, Dewar took the opportunity to activate his male fecundity, and secretly mingled with the Queen. Bernie, by a stroke of luck, stumbled upon the mural mechanism, and entered a secret chamber with his former lover, Archeon. This place is probably a location even David hasn't been to. Bernie just wants to retrieve his missing memories. He inexplicably feels familiar with this place. Unexpectedly, Cleon I appeared, 
and brought forth a hidden or deliberately erased story. 610 years ago on Trantor, the young Prince Cleon accidentally triggered the mural mechanism, and entered the magical space behind the wall. It was a secret prison that hadn't seen visitors for thousands of years. The young prince discovered Mel inside, who had been preserved in slices for over 18,000 years. Mel still retained her self-awareness, and the young prince enjoyed listening to her stories, so he often sneaked into the secret chamber. Gradually, Prince Cleon grew up and became an adult. He was no longer the carefree child. With his mother's death and the turbulent situation, Cleon had to become the emperor, and he could no longer visit this place frequently. Mel knew she had to seize the opportunity to regain her freedom, so she told Cleon a story from the past. In a long time ago, Mel had led troops into battle, but unfortunately, she lost a war and was sent to Emperor Abranis. The emperor became infatuated with Mel, and performed meticulous surgical operations on her for study. Soon, the emperor realized he would age and die, while Mel remained immortal. Fearing a resurgence of robotic wars, he turned Mel into slices, and trapped her forever in this unknown prison. Despite this, the emperor did not destroy Mel, which demonstrated how precious this robot was. Mel pleaded with Cleon to set her free, promising to faithfully serve him and assist in ruling the empire. But the young emperor rejected Mel's request. One day, he returned to the secret chamber. Cleon helped restore Mel to her original state, but he didn't immediately grant her freedom. He resumed his childhood habit, of coming back to listen to Mel's stories. This relationship lasted for a long time, until Cleon became an old man. Only then did he let go of his guard and release Mel. At that moment, the robot could have snapped Cleon's neck, but she hesitated, and that hesitation forever missed the opportunity. Cleon implanted a device inside her, that allowed Mel to disregard any robot laws, and harm humans at will, but she could never disobey Cleon's commands. How could this be called freedom? A moment of softness turned Mel into an eternal slave, because Cleon invented clone humans, ensuring the hereditary rule of the empire. However, he also granted Mel significant power. Cleon would erase the memory of the clones, so Mel could shape their choices as she pleased, shape everything about the clones. The lack of this memory, led to the three David brothers not knowing how Mel came to be. Since their birth, this robot advisor has been guarding the empire, even though it was not her intention. Bernie understood after hearing this, the three brothers and the previous clones, are just puppets sitting on the throne. In fact, since the death of the first, the control of the empire has been in Mel's hands. Bernie and Archeon want to leave this cursed place, but they were locked inside by the first emperor. Let's take a look at Garl's side again. When the ceremony reached a critical moment, Salva finally arrived at the scene. She threw the disruptor that smuggled out of prison, and successfully rescued Garl. As the pursuers were about to arrive, Salva handed the Elementor to Garl, urging her to pilot the beggar and leave quickly. Unexpectedly, the female leader was lying in wait. She infiltrated Garl's mind, attempting to disrupt her thoughts. Yet, Garl managed to break free from the illusion. The two fought in the narrow cabin. Meanwhile, Salva was engaged in combat with the pursuers. It took her some effort to defeat her opponents. Salva entered the beggar to support Garl, but the female leader was truly relentless. In a critical moment, Selden unexpectedly appeared and directly smashed the female leader to death. He miraculously wasn't drowned. Meanwhile, Moss locked Mallow and the others in a prison cell. Actually, he doesn't have much attachment to the Empire anymore. The reason Moss is still working for David, is to protect the lives of the people around him. At this moment, David arrived at his spaceship, and ordered Moss to establish communication with Terminus. After saying that, he took Mel and the guards with him, and set foot on the land of Terminus. David found the place where they manufacture various components. The technology here is highly advanced, as well as the people's unwavering beliefs, are far beyond David's imagination. He no longer intends to pretend to make peace. David ordered Mel to signal Moss, to command the invincible warships to seize everything here. Then he ordered the soldiers to kill the believers and advisors, leaving only the lives of the scientists. The commander of Terminus tried to step forward and stop him, but David stabbed the commander directly in the abdomen. Moss instructed his closest deputy, Mustached Man, to lead the squadron in an all-out attack. Mustached Man led his subordinates out to confront the enemy. Both sides manipulate battleships to engage in fierce combat. Mustached Man's piloting skills were quite impressive. He narrowly escaped death several times. It seemed strange that he was given so much screen time, which meant that Mustached Man was likely to meet a tragic fate. Sure enough, his warship experienced a sudden malfunction, and instantly lost control, plummeting downward. Meanwhile, Mel wanted David to leave Terminus quickly, yet David intended to enter the vault. The Prophet Selden had established a defense system here, not just anyone can enter, but David was arrogant. Not only was he unafraid, but he also unfastened his halo, and removed his armor, shouting as he walked towards the vault. However, the next moment, Prophet Selden appeared. He called David alone for a conversation in the vault. Mel quickly followed suit, 
Selden took out a replica of the Elementor from his hand, preparing to hand it over to David. This action is really confusing. I guess Selden from the first foundation, after knowing about the second foundation, realized that he was a sacrifice, so he decided to give up on his side, and make the Empire drop its guard. At this moment, Mel received a message from Moss, and found out that the people from Terminus had already been repelled. Nevertheless, the invincible warships were severely damaged. Upon hearing this, David was very pleased. He ordered Moss to shoot down the invincible warships, and completely destroy Terminus. After saying that, David took the replica of the Elementor and left. Meanwhile, Mel had been observing by the side. She realized that the 17th David she had nurtured, had made the situation worse and worse. Mel left the spaceship and prepared to return to Trantor immediately. At this moment, Mustached Man suddenly sent a distress signal. Upon hearing this, Moss breathed a sigh of relief. The next moment, his heart turned cold, because Mustached Man had fallen to the surface of Terminus. Meanwhile, David was giving the order to destroy the entire galaxy. Moss bid farewell to the other party in tears. In the end, he heartlessly gave the order to fire. And so, Terminus turned to nothingness. All the people were consumed by flames. Inside the secret prison on Trantor, Bernie and Archeon are trying to find a way to escape. Unexpectedly, Mel suddenly appears. She hurriedly came back because, she sensed that the prison had been discovered. She understands Bernie's anger after learning the truth. But she is also controlled by Klee and I. All the tragedies are caused by that old man. Archeon takes the opportunity to persuade Mel to work together to facilitate David's marriage to the Queen, so that they can completely end the dynasty inherited by the clones. Mel knows this truth as well, but her programming commands her to guard the Empire. Robots have no way to disobey programming. Mel will spare no effort to destroy this marriage, and continue the tradition of the clone dynasty. She frames the Queen for plotting to assassinate the Emperor, and imprisons the Queen, awaiting execution. Now Bernie and Archeon break into the Forbidden Area, determined to uncover the unknowable truth. Mel has no choice but to kill them to eliminate future troubles. On the other side, Dua learns that the Queen has been captured. He immediately goes to stop Mel. Unexpectedly, he notices a green mark on her neck. He immediately recalls Bernie's interpretation of the Imperial Mural. A green mark on the neck represents a traitor. Dua changes his approach. He asks Mel to come to the palace later for a detailed conversation. As Mel passes by a mirrored sculpture, she sees the green mark on her neck. The ultimate winner of this power game is still uncertain. After Dua leaves, he breaks into the place where the queen is held. He quickly takes out the guards, and escapes with her. At the same time, David looked at the ruined Terminus, savoring the joy of victory. He had no intention of stopping there. David made the nun reveal, the names of all the planets that had submitted to Terminus. She handed over the names of seven planets, and David planned to destroy them one by one. Moss believed that once Terminus was destroyed, the remaining factions would surely submit to the Empire so there was no need to go to extremes, but David despised anyone challenging him. He slapped Moss as soon as he approached. Moss had already lost the most important person to him, and he would never carry out the Emperor's orders. David decided to remove Moss from his position, and commanded the spacemen to jump to the remaining faction's planet. The other side pretended to comply, but actually cancelled the jump program. Meanwhile, Mallow sensed something, and his arm emitted a faint light. Then the jump program completely malfunctioned causing the ships in the fleet to collide with each other. If things continued like this, the entire fleet would be destroyed, meaning no one would be able to leave today. It turns out David had fallen into a trap. The spacemen handed Mallow over to the Empire, which was actually part of the Prophet Selden's plan. His goal was to have Mallow join Moss's command fleet, because Mallow had a special jump program implanted by Selden. The spacemen activated this program just now, trapping the Empire's finest fleet. Since the moment David ordered the attack on Terminus, he had already been caught in a trap. Now, infuriated, he punched Mallow, and ruthlessly stepped on his vulnerable neck. Fortunately, Moss rushed over and pushed David away. He wanted to personally kill the Emperor to avenge the mustached man. However, David is not someone to mess with, though he acted like a fool throughout the season. He was also a formidable opponent. David kicked Moss into the airlock, and opened the valve, but in the next second, Moss, who was about to be crushed by the vacuum of space, turned into David. It turns out that Mallow had switched places with Moss during their fight and hid the other node inside David. So when Moss entered the airlock, he swapped positions with David. Now it was time to solve the fleet's jump problem. It was impossible to save everyone, so they could only use an escape pod to rescue one person. Mallow gave this spot to the nun, hoping she would continue spreading hope. After bidding farewell with a kiss, they parted ways. Moss and Mallow opened a bottle of fine wine, prepared to perish with the ship. Regardless, they had saved seven planets, so this way of dying wasn't too bad. As a blinding white light appeared, the massive spaceship turned into a magnificent fireworks display. 
Mel saw everything through the monitor, and, at that moment, her subordinate hurriedly entered, and brought up a set of images, it turned out that Dewar, accompanied by the Queen, had announced David's death to Trantor, and his intention to take over her sister-in-law's position, the subordinates wanted to apprehend them, but Mel quickly realized, that they were imposters disguised as the Queen's servants, the real Dewar and the Queen had already escaped, and they even had a child, Mel saw that the situation was out of control, and could only activate the next batch of clone soldiers, moreover, she had obtained something special, a replica of the Elementor, which David No. 17 had acquired, the scene shifts back to Ignis, where the truth of Selden's survival is finally revealed, because Gaal entered Selden's mind just before he was about to drown, she discovered the truth, Gaal can feel Selden's sensations, see everything that Selden sees, she uses her telepathic abilities to control the guards, making them unlock the iron chains, Gaal manipulates Selden's body to knock out the guard, drowns him in the river, and uses his corpse as a substitute for Selden, fooling everyone's eyes, at this point, the story feels more like fantasy than science fiction, Gaal can share a brain with Selden, and the female leader didn't notice the flaw, because Gaal silently recited prime numbers throughout the process, creating a numerical barrier, protecting her thoughts from being detected. At this moment, the beggar detected the approach of a life form. All the telepaths from Ignis gathered outside the spaceship. However, they didn't have any malicious intent. In fact, the female leader had been using her telepathic abilities, controlling everyone's thoughts. Now that the main characters killed her, they inadvertently liberated everyone's minds and sense of self. Selden, upon hearing this, opened the cabin door. The telepaths kneeled down, expressing their gratitude. Just when everyone thought the crisis was over, an unexpected event occurred. The female leader had hidden a portion of her thoughts inside a young boy, concealing a part of her mind. She controlled him to pick up a gun and aim it at Gaal. At the critical moment, Salva threw a flying knife towards the boy, and used her body to block the bullet. Salva comforted Gaal not to be sad. She would die today, proving that the future can be changed. They still have a chance to get it back on the right track. After Salva finished speaking, she lost her breath. Gaal personally cremated her daughter. Afterwards, Selden and she entered cryogenic sleep together, preparing to travel 150 years into the future, arriving at the node where they would meet the mule, to see if Salva's death caused any disruptions. On the other side, the nun is still floating in space, with the oxygen levels about to run out. She unexpectedly flew into the vault. The bishop and other deceased people were hiding here, even though Terminus was destroyed. Selden saved all the residents. It seems we were wrong to blame the old man in the previous episodes. He didn't treat human lives as pawns. In the blink of an eye, 152 years have passed. The mule woke up from his anguish. He dreamt of the telepathic woman again, and he had a premonition that Gaal was coming. The story of this season ends here. This season is truly whimsical. The screenwriters wrote it whatever they wanted, regardless of the foreshadowing or logic. Every time I open a new episode, my mood is always, I want to see how you're going to write it, but overall, it's worth watching.